Well, good afternoon if you are on the East Coast of the United States. Good morning if you are further west. Good evening if you are in London or Berlin or Port Elizabeth, South Africa. And good overnight if you are places further west from there. Or is that east? That's east from there. Sorry. I'm Fred Plotkin, and this is Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Idajo, the place where classical music happens. As you know, Idajo is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to fans all around the world. Those of you who have followed my program for the past year and a half know that I invite people on the show, many of the musicians, who inspire me. And in some cases, they're people I know very well personally. In some cases, they're people I've never met. In today's case, it's a gentleman who I've only conversed with once in person. We were in Dallas, if you recall. And But I have followed him artistically for quite a while in his still short career. I have loved his writing. And one thing that I really want to get into with my guest, whose name I will say in a moment, um, is his role as a writer, because he's actually a wonderful writer. Musa, I'm going to call you by your first name. And my first question for you is, what is the question you are most asked in your life? Uh, how to pronounce my last name. That's exactly. So <laughs> <laughs> if you would kindly do that. <laughs> uh, so my name is Musa, as you heard. Last name is Ngungwana. 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 I usually tell people that they have to voice the N and then do one attack. The, the, the G gives you a g -g 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 sound. The Q is the click. And then ah. the combination of the G and the Q gives you, uh, but the N helps with the attack. It takes a while, though. There are some people in South Africa who can't um, pronounce this, who can't make these sounds because they speak different languages. And usually people like me, then you learn it from a very young age. Or there are some people who can speak my language, but they still have difficulties with the clicks. What languages did you grow up speaking? I grew up speaking Isikosa, which is my, I was about to say my mother's tongue, but it's not. It's my grandmother's tongue who raised me. My mother was Zulu, so she spoke some of that. So I understood Zulu because Zulu and Kosa are like sister languages. Think Spanish and Portuguese or Spanish and Italian. Even more closely than that, you can, my friend, one of my friends and colleagues, Sunny Boy Gaza, is Zulu. And when he speaks, he speaks Isizulu, I speak Isikosa. And we can understand one another as long as we speak high Zulu and high cross. If we speak some dialects that we have to try and explain what we meant. Do you have any idea how many languages there are in South Africa? Well, official languages, there are 11, but there are more than that. We are not even talking about dialects, just languages, official languages, um, 11. But within Kosa, the so-called Kosa nation itself, you have... Um, another nationality within this course are called Amambondo. They have their own dialect. You, you parts of the you you go far east into the eastern province where I'm from. There are dialects of Kosa there that are not written but are understood. They are, sometimes they can understand they understand what I'm saying, but I can't understand what they are saying. Um, so they, they are, they, there's quite a lot of languages. Nigeria has more, of course, but South Africa has. Then you still have the, the language of the San, the Khoisan people, which is not, I think there's a, there are discussions about that in South Africa, about having, because they are the very first people in South Africa to have that as part of the official languages. I don't know how far that can go or will go. Well, I know that there are the languages of the people who are from originally from South Africa. And then there are the languages of the people who arrived, to use a polite term, um, Afrikaans and English. And yeah. those languages, I, I, I've never been to South Africa, not yet. It is number one of the countries I've not been to in the world that I want to go to. Um, I've followed, I've had many friends from South Africa and I've followed your countries 
long and complicated history. And I'm a huge admirer of the music and the choral traditions and the way that the languages of South Africa influence the sound of the music and the way the voices are placed. To me, it's just something glorious. And there are so many great singers, most of them black, but also some of them white who have come out of South Africa, who all have this remarkable, I'll call it a forward placement of the speech and the sound and the voice. So yeah. that Johan Bota, the great, he was an Afrikaans tenor, had wonderful placement right here and every word was clear and the sound was pure. And really all the black South Africans I've heard have a similar, very forward thing. Am I on to something or is this just by yeah. coincidence? No, no, no. Yes, you are. Because even actually Africans is South African. Uh, because it's a mixture of the people, the Dutch East India Company who came with Jan van Riebeek in 1652. At the time, they spoke Dutch, and there were some people who spoke Flemish and Portuguese. So think of Haiti or New Orleans, where you have now a confluence of all these languages. Then you have the Bantu people, the Khausa, the Zulus. Then you've got the Khoisan people. Then it, it was started actually by some of the slaves and the workers who didn't want their bosses to know what they were talking about. So Africans came as that. Later on, it was then claimed as an official language where the people who started it felt it was no longer theirs, but it's now people are starting to realize. But going back then to what you're talking about, when we speak it's like Italian, our languages are really upfront, it's bright. And also our personalities in South Africa, we are really, we want to talk to you, want to hug you, even if we don't know. know you, we are loud. And that can be very problematic you, if you go to places <laughs> where people are like, I had some problems where, when I arrived in Philadelphia because I, I, I didn't know that there were wars. Forget talking to girls where you have to be very careful because you don't want them to feel unsafe. But even with boys sometimes, you know, you like, you go to a certain floor, you want to talk to someone, then they wanted to be on their own because they think of music or the coaching. It took me a while to get to understand that, that when I was talking, I was loud. I was too bright. That's how we speak. We like that. I happen to love that. And to me, the South African choral tradition, um, there's something called the International Opera Awards. And I remember when the chorus of the Cape Town Opera won best chorus in the world. And I thought that was very justified. As I said, I've not been to South Africa, but I've heard them perform elsewhere. And a few years ago, we had a South African company come to New York where I am and do a wonderful uh, South African influence production of Mozart's The Zabafla to the Magic Flute. I don't know if you ever saw that. They did a yes. marimba. It was just uh, such a beautiful, and glorious yes. and faithful production. It was completely in keeping with the spirit of that opera, which after all is set in Africa. People forget that. But yeah. the magic flute is set in Egypt and therefore Africa, the other end of Africa from where you are, but Africa nonetheless. Um, as I mentioned to the audience, I love your writing. And I've read you in English, of course. How did you, when I say acquire your English, you know what I mean. You grew up speaking yes. English, but there's a difference between we all, if we speak languages, we speak them, but some people really can speak them and use them. Actually, I didn't grow up speaking it, which is uh -huh. why. Um, I grew up speaking Kosa, Zulu, and there were some neighbors who spoke Sesotho, and so, I, I mean, I don't speak fluent Sesotho, but I can get by. You can't mm. really gossip about me in Sesotho because I understand <laughs> that. Unless, again, going back to the issue of dialect, then you speak in that. But um, English, we learned English through reading and writing first. And so our handicap was this were taught by, say, native Kosas, Soto, or Tswana, or Zulu people, who went to st study at the then teachers' colleges. And so they spoke perfect English. 
with whatever accent you can assign to them. But we, they, so when they taught us, they would teach, unfortunately teach you, if you went to a township school, a ghetto school like I did, you were taught English in the native language, just okay. like they taught you mathematics or other things. So I realized that my vocabulary was better reading and writing first than speech. So when I went to high school, I went to what we call comprehensive schools, another word, technical schools, where you could study motor body engineering, electrical engineering, electricity, and so forth. So I chose that route from the, the eighth and ninth grade. And then in the 10th grade, I changed uh, to study physical science, mathematics, biology, and all that. In my mind, I wanted to be a doctor. Um, and so, but English is what then, when I went to that school, because there were white teachers who were teaching now chemical engineering and all these um, skills and crafts. So because of that, then I, I had for the first time people who spoke the, the, the language. Now, some of them were Africans speakers. So English was not their first language, but they understood it. So that forced me. And I used to listen to BBC radio or watch CNN. Mm -hmm try and pick up on that the writing even today it's easier for me to write than speak unless in a context like this where you and i are talking and i have space to think about what i want to say then i can have some coherence but if it's like it's so fast within five minutes you want some answers i may give you some answers but they're not as comprehensive or thought out but writing which is why then or on Facebook, if I write something and I post it, unless it's something, say I'm grateful for a performance, I'm grateful for now the gig that I got, I would post it immediately. But if it's something, if it's an observation, then usually I take time out to write it, to read it. I may post it after a few days because I have to think how it affects other people. But so I learned then English that, that way. So before I even was able to be able to say I speak English fluently, my writing was better than that. Although the writing has been changing over time, especially based on I have friends on, on Facebook. I would watch because you, you are a writer. I, I watch how you write. Then I would watch people, uh, native speakers like you, there are other people in England like Yehuda um, and other people who, are, who have studied English or in other languages in Oxford. So I just watch and then I do some research. And through now writing, it's been, I feel it's been getting better. I have a net for storytelling. I love that because also I learned English through reading books. I, I even remember the very first book I read was called Down Second Avenue, which was written by a South African um, author who has since passed away, I think in 2013 or 2014, if I'm not mistaken, Eskian Patele, who went to study creative writing at the University of Denver. One of my great uncles, who, had, who was a political prisoner at, in, in Robin, on Robin Island, had um, left this box that had LPs, Donny Hathaway, and all these Stevie mm -hmm. Wonder, Ray Charles. Underneath them were books. The very first book I, I picked was down Second Avenue. It took mm. me two years to fully understand what was being said there because I had to circle all the words I didn't understand. And when, when I think I was 10 or 11, I fully now understood what I went back and I was just rereading the book because it he had um, the ability to paint uh, pictures with his words. So I've always loved that. Uh, and I, also what forced me was when then I went to study opera and drama you had to speak the language, but not only that, you also had to write about characters. And one of our teachers, stagecraft teachers would say, hey, go out to the park, sit there, watch people. And then after that, give me a report, two page report about what you saw. I said, but that's stalking people. He said, no, you just watch, you don't engage, just watch. Say, there was an old man I saw, a young person I saw, a disabled person, handicapped person I saw, and so forth. What, what, were, what were they wearing, what colors and so forth. And then I thought, oh, now there's vocabulary that you have to know to describe things. So my love then of writing, even in Corsa, I speak fluent Corsa, but funnily enough, even to this day, though to my credit, my Corsa is better than my sister's who lives, who lives in <laughs> South Africa. 
because they speak English now most of the time. But my writing and reading Corsa is even way better than hers. She can't even write, write or read Corsa. Do you think that living outside of South Africa for in recent years, because you're based in Philadelphia and you've sung all over Europe and, and North America and elsewhere, means that you connect more to your salsa, I'll X-H-O-S-A, I believe, um, yeah. and things from South Africa because you're not there that much? Yes, 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 that's the truth. Because, you know, I remember there were things that didn't matter to me when I was in Cape Town was studying music. I was more interested in opera because it was new to me. And so I was trying to cram, you know, you're in college, you study four years of college, you have to now understand all these things and you can't really learn everything within four years. And then, you know, I'm preparing myself now to leave for uh, Philadelphia where I'm going to meet people who've studied at Yale, Juliet, Curtis, and all these other places and so they already have their masters or their undergraduate. So AVA is now a professional school where you focus mostly on performance. So there's something they know that you don't. So I'm now playing catch up. I knew then that I had to research as much as I could. But when I was at AVA and I was feeling comfortable on my pace of learning things, then you realize when people are talking about Thanksgiving for the first time, and that's what I love about America, people are just so lovely. Everyone invites you for Thanksgiving. And so you don't, you never feel that you're alone. But then at some point, I remember during Christmas, I remember uh, coaching at AV with Maestro Makatsoris. We were working, we worked on 20th until the 24th, took a day off on the 25th and the 26th, then came back and worked on the 27th. It was just us in the school because everyone else has gone home. I did miss home. And then from that day, uh, which was 2010, I... I started thinking about more and appreciating things about home, which I had overlooked, culture, the language, especially when people say, hey, what's your name? What does your name mean? You know, and you have to like now think about that. You know, uh, your mom, uh, which part of KwaZulu Natal is she from? And so forth. You're like, wait, I didn't know some of these parts. I, you know, I took them for granted. Um, so yeah, I've had uh, a lot of appreciation about home because you're no longer there. So if ever there was some, so some things clouding your judgment, you're no longer within, you're outside, you can see clearer. I want listeners to know that AVA is the Academy of Vocal Arts in Philadelphia, which is one of the many fine musical institutions we have in the United States, especially along the East Coast, historically, basically from Boston to Baltimore the major cities and many of the universities have superb schools of music and then certain big universities, especially Indiana, but also Michigan and Colorado. There are places around the country, University of North Texas, that have wonderful schools for singing. So it is around the country, but especially the Northeastern corridor from Boston to Baltimore. I have a very, very dear friend. She's one of my oldest friends. We're friends for more than 40 years, who I met in New York City when she lived here. And she's from South Africa. She's a white person of Jewish background, and her family escaped Germany to come to South Africa. And we're very sensitized, of course, to being discriminated against because of who you were. In her case, the family was Jewish. Uh, and she was born in Johannesburg. And when she was here in New York, she's traveled many places, lived many places. As she says, she's been washed with all the waters of the world. What she always described to me about South Africa was the smells, the sounds, the sights. Everything was about the senses when she spoke about South Africa, the color of the soil, the sunsets. <clears throat> it was so very pictorial and evocative. And this was a woman who grew up in a big city, but somehow had a very strong connection to the visual, to the weather, to the to nature, to sounds, more than people I meet in most countries. I experience this with people from Finland and very Northern places as well. To some degree, Italy in the Mediterranean, but less so. I think because those areas are just a little more mixed and, and right in the middle of things, whereas South Africa and Finland and Norway are far away. 
Yeah. And her name is Stephanie and her evocations of these places was really poetic. And I have a feeling that you similarly could evoke all the nature. I mean, if I were to ask you to talk about some of the smells and tastes, and I don't necessarily mean food, although you certainly can mention that, what contacts your nose and mouth about South Africa? So I grew up in, in, in a township within a big city, but every holiday, my grandmother always saved some money so that we could go visit one of her sisters. And fortunately for us, they lived in various parts of the country. And I remember our own province, the Eastern province, just first the smell of the soil from loamy soil to sandy soil and all that. And the rivers, I remember there's a place they call, well, the river called Ikume. That has some really, you can just drink from the river without even purifying the water. It's that kind of a river. And it's along the Hawksback Mountains, close to Alice. That's where the University of Forte is and Nelson Mandela is. Just the smell of the water, the freshness of the water and the sound of the water. It's unmistakable. Of course, if you've been there, then there are cows. I think that just comes. I live in Philadelphia. I've never seen cows since I've been in America. Unless you drive, you go to... I don't know, Glimmer Glass, you might see some tractors, maybe, maybe. New but Jersey has cows. <laughs> they, they are, but, you know, you rarely see them unless you, like, have to drive and go countryside. <laughs> Just the smell of the cow dung mm. and being able to differentiate, oh, that's a, that's a cow dung, or that's a goat, or that's sheep, or those are horses or donkeys, mm -hmm. things that are peculiar like that the smell of the fruits, some berries I've never seen anywhere else in the world that are there, right? And For example, in, talk about some of the berries. Some of the berries, I don't know the English words for, and mm. that's on me to actually, I, now you've made me think about that. There are some berries that we, we, we have blueberries and all strawberries. Okay, we have those, but there are berries that I've never seen outside even of, uh, the pale, there's a place they call Kobo Kobo or Keskamahuk, where there are three rivers meeting in there. One of my great aunts who since passed away lived there. She was a nurse and we used to go there. And that's a very rural area. But they had some berries called Ingwenye. I don't know the word, the English word for it. I'm sure there's some scientific word they've come up with now. And they were red. Mm -hmm. It's not strawberries. It's not any of the berries, you know, but the taste is unmistakable. And so also in my own house, we had figs, a fig tree. Mm. And they took down that, uh, that now when I was still in high school, before I finished high school. And one of my friends had a peach tree. And so, but the fig, we could make gems from the fig tree. Mm -hmm. uh, that, those are the, 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 the colors that I remember. Also, Port Elizabeth, when we still didn't have roads and all that, when it... It's very windy. They call it the windy city like Chicago. I don't think it's as windy like Chicago. Not as intense, but it can get windy. And so if you go to the townships, you can see the dust, the red dust, or different, depending which part of the city you are in, you can see that. And so what do you do in America? Is it Labor Day or before Labor Day where you stop wearing white and all that? You don't wear white. Labor Day. Right? Mm -hmm. You do not wear whites well, if you live in Sweden, because if you do that, you can get out of the house thinking the weather is fine. And then within two hours, it has changed to it being windy and it messes up your whites. So you are the author of a book called Odyssey of a South African Opera Singer, or is it yes. Singer? Opera Singer. Uh, uh, Odyssey of an African Opera Singer. Yes. Opera Singer. Mm -hmm. What prompted you to write that book? That book was not supposed to be a book. It just came out as um, me venting. Mm. I, I felt that I, I needed help. I knew I couldn't afford therapy. Fortunately, I realized without anyone telling me that, hey, something was bothering me. I knew part of, a greater part of what was bothering me is the the lack of a relationship with my father where I had tried for 20 years and nothing just happened. And then I thought I was over that life. But I must say some things really triggered me. 
when I was at AVA, I think even more so when we're graduating, to know that no one could come from home because we couldn't afford that. And by the time I was uh, graduating, my, my grandmother had long passed away six years before. My mother couldn't afford to come there. And then I remember people would come, all my friends had their parents and their fathers. And I thought it was normal to, to uh, for people like me or anyone else to not have relationships with fathers. Until then you are in a situation where people, even when you go to university and you live in a dormitory, people are there with their parents and their fathers. I was like, whoa, this is new to me. That triggered me. More so when I was graduating from AVA. And then there was a Mandela opera that fell through that we were supposed to do in Johannesburg. And that opera would have been done in Johannesburg. And then the following year, 2015, would have potentially gone to a place like Ravinia Festival, which was a big in deal because then the Chicago yeah. uh, orchestra would play, you know, and so forth. That fell through, of course. That hit me mainly because now I was done with school and I didn't have a job during the summer. I still had to pay rent. And then from that, there were competitions I'd done before, like the Julio Gari competition. So you win the competition, you don't get paid immediately. You still have to wait. I think that was around May, but you have to wait until September to do a big gala. Then you get paid. It's all part of the program. You understand that. But it, it really hits then when if you don't have money and there was a gig you were expecting and it's not coming, so you're like, hey, I five months, where is the money going to come from? Then I was thinking of my father that if I had a relationship with him or, you know, this is someone I should be calling and all that, that hit me. So I started writing out of anger and it was not supposed to see uh, a light of day on any social media because I don't like writing about personal life like that, not negative things at least. Then I made a mistake. I'm going to say a mistake because I started sharing it with a friend of mine, Amanda Edelman who at the time was working as a marketing manager at AVA. Little did I know that she had an editorial background. She loved reading and writing. And she's very, how should I say? I, was a, uh, I don't want to use the negative word because I love it dearly. She, she's very convincing for a lack of a better word. Right, she doesn't persuasive. give up. Very persuasive, thank you very much. <laughs> right, and so she, she convinced me that, hey, uh, you, that, that was good what you wrote. Obviously, it's, it's out of anger. Maybe write another draft and take out these words and see where it takes you. It could be a narrative. I said, no, 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 there's no narrative. It was just me venting. And I don't know what pushed me to tell you. She said, probably the Holy Spirit or something. That's what she said. So I started, and her, her husband started ganging up on me with her. So I would send her the stuff. Then she was like, well, I think we we'll have some chapters here. Are you thinking of sharing some of this on social media? I said, absolutely no. She said, yes, you are going to share. But by the time we'd share some snippets on social media, by then we had curated and you know, edited them so that they were like more of a narrative. I remember what the very first thing I wrote, which was really out of anger, was about my father, how much I really despised him at the time. That would become my second chapter which now evolved into becoming a narrative about growing up in a ghetto instead of it now being uh, about hating my father. But it was more about how it feels being a boy growing up without a father, having other older boys who also themselves had had no father figures. And so they learned everything from trial and error. So you learn from them because you're trying to emulate or trying to belong. So it became more of a sociological kind of a chapter touching on those aspects. But it started as an anger and the curse words at three in the morning drunk. <laughs> uh, so that's how the book came about. First, I self-published the book with the help of uh, Miss Mary Nielsen. Uh, she calls her publishing, Zion Publishing, but we also published through Create Space, uh, an Amazon company. Then I was just doing it for a few people, for some patrons who might be interested in where I came from. I had no objectives of it being like a, a published and all of that. But I, I did, once it was out, it, I, I was kind of sad that there, there were no reviews. I've had reviews for, for performances in places where you didn't think there's going to be a reviewer. 
So I was like, it, I, I'm not saying my book is good, but I'm saying that at least it deserves for someone to review. I sent it through different newspapers. I even sent it to the Inquirer in Philadelphia. And they responded, but they said, because of it's a self-published book, we don't consider it professional. It must come from a house where there's been editors to review it and all that. Of course, I didn't understand at the time. When someone says no to you and you want something so badly, you think mm -hmm. they are just against you. The same as can be said for auditions. When you go for an audition and you're so desperate, uh, you don't realize there could be 500 other people auditioning for the same thing. You just want it because you're desperate. So you think they're up against you or something. You learn later that it was not even about you, or maybe there were some things you needed to improve. In hindsight, that book was great for that period, but then I knew that if I was going to get an editor or a publisher, I needed to work more on it. So I started hunting for people. It, it, it was rejected. And the, 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 the publishers are even worse, I would say, than opera people or theater people. <laughs> because they go for the jugular veins. They just tell you, you suck. Stop writing. You're not a writer. Where did you go to school? I, I'm laughing in case audiences don't know. I work in opera. I've written nine books. You are absolutely right. <laughs> oh, they go for them. There was one of them from Canada who said, you know, listen, I don't want to be mean to you, but come back when you are like Renee Fleming. I'm like, <laughs> I will never be like Renee Fleming. Oh, come on, that's like a level too high. I can aspire to be that, but I can never be here. First and foremost, she's a soprano. So there's that, yes. and I'm a bass baritone. <laughs> and, I, and then Penguin Random House, the South African division, I wrote to them and said it, they rejected it. Then months later, I was writing some of my musings. So there's a lady there, Marlene Fryer, who is an editor in the... Um, the serious part of the, the, the book writing for a like, for a better word, uh, you've got fiction, nonfiction. So she saw some of my writing on my Facebook artist page where I was just sharing with friends. She saw this. She remembered me from one of the uh, manuscripts I had sent her. She said, well, I remember, it. I love your stories, but I feel that the way you wrote your book um, is not the same as you're writing your stories. And so, well, if you can write another manuscript, edit that one and try to involve more of the style of like, as if you are chatting to someone, let's see what happens. So I, I worked on that and I sent it again. They accepted and they said, if you, if you are willing to work with our editors and they chose someone who studied English at the University of Cape Town. So we started working with her. And of course she challenged me because there were some things she said, uh, I feel that you, you've written this, but you, you are telling us, you are not showing us, and there are some things you are hiding, you are just skimming over. So we need to get that ch second chapter where I'm talking about my father, really. What was I thought was three, four pages, now it, it was longer. She wanted me to get deeper into this thing. I must confess that at first, <laughs> I felt so uncomfortable. I was like, it's just not what we do. We, as Africans, we we have layers. We are very happy, but they, they, are, they are secrets we die with. And I felt that she was like really pushing the buttons to say, ah, yeah, 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 it might be your secret, but we want to know about it. Don't, don't just tease us and tell us that, oh, you despise your father. We want to know why. How are things now? How have they moved? And so forth. And then there was an issue of where they would say, okay, who's your target market? What do you mean target market? I don't have any target market. I'm just writing for people who follow me and that's it. Or no, if you're going to sell books, we need a target market. We need to. So those things, which sometimes when people push me for my musings, I have musings, I think enough where we could build, say, and say one volume of Musa's musings. But I know that the process then, if I'm trying to get a publisher, then I have to think of a target market and all that. And sometimes I felt that even in that book, I maybe sold them short because I, I, I remember there was a, an event in Philadelphia where we would do the book event. I was so happy. And I invited people on Facebook and people responded positively. Now, this was seven years ago. I've learned so much over, on social media over the years, but then I was still naive. And 
and I saw that there were maybe 250 people who said they were going to come. I thought, well, not all 250, so some maybe, let's say, 150 actually come. So let me get 100 books mm. now. <laughs> so <laughs> I've got 100 books. Now, the, these books are not free. I still have to buy them. Even if I buy them at a discount, I still have to buy them. I have to pay for the shipping and so forth. So they cost quite. And, and then I got some friends to help with uh, wine, you know, finger foods and all that. And we were at the first Presbyterian church in Philadelphia on 21st and Walnut, where I worked uh, as when I was still a student, I, I used to work there. So I have, I have close friendships with people there. And so uh, the pastor then, uh, Jesse Ghana, just opened the doors of the church and were there. From the anticipated 150 people or the 250 that said they were coming, now it was down to 65 people. It's like, okay, we're not selling 100 books here. From the 100 books that I have and from those 65 people, I ended up selling maybe 37 books. And there were people who came and they would talk about my book. What's it about? They said, I'm going to order it on Amazon. I'm like, but it's here now. And then other people would say, oh, yeah, I, I just came because they said there was wine and so forth. And yes, then others, that's, would that's ask me, <laughs> others would ask me about other people's books while they're there looking at mine. And that so deflated me. I did some other events in Florida. There was even an event where I, I did in, in some club in New Jersey. I sold two books. <laughs> <laughs> and I had had to wait for people to give speeches and so forth. <laughs> I, did, I didn't have a car, so I got a friend to drive all the way to Jersey. It's like an hour in wherever we were. And I was so deflated. But I'm so grateful for all that experience. It has taught me so much about rejection, the layers of it, what really is about you, what it's about people, to accept that, combine that even with just auditions. They've, they've taught me so much. I now don't take anything personal. You, with this story, have reminded me of a story in my life that I've never told publicly. So if you will permit me, I'm going to do it. So sure. um, <laughs> it's a very similar experience. When I worked at the Metropolitan Opera in the 1980s, I, I was the performance manager and the hours were very long. I loved it. I'm not complaining about the hours, but I would often be up very late in the night and I was too keyed up to go to sleep. So I began to write a cookbook in part because I was a close friend of Luciano Pavarotti and I used to cook for him, with him. And he encouraged me to write an Italian cookbook because I had trained in Italy. And so I produced a pasta cookbook and the title, my title was Pasta Diva and there was a lot of opera in the book, but the publisher changed it to the authentic pasta book. And we used to have a very elegant department store in New York City called Altman's on 34th Street and Fifth Avenue, where a lot of chic people would shop and so on. And all the way up on the fifth floor in a faraway room, I was invited to do my first ever cooking demonstration, making pasta on a little table with a burner and a garbage pail to dump out the pasta water and another little burner to make the sauce. And I made carbonara, which is made of guanciale, of pork cheek, of uh, egg and pepper and, and cheese. And exactly five people showed up. Wow. And they were all older women. And they, as I was trying to teach and nervously cook and speak, um, they said, well, are you putting salt in that? I can't eat salt. And is that pork? I don't eat pork. And my doctor says I can't have eggs. And there's too much wow. cholesterol in the cheese. And I don't like pepper. Don't put pepper in mine. It's as if they showed up for a free meal. And I was <laughs> sweating, metaphorically, and not only, and knew that I was not going to sell any of the books that were stacked up there. Yeah. And suddenly, this the room cooled, and there was this glorious vision walking behind the five women and it was one of our greatest opera stars and she gestured to me like this like rise bring up your cheek 
glow, expand, and so on. She was coaching me from behind. And I did, and I sort of rose up, and my my speech changed and so on. And I kept cooking and, and speaking, and the women were not any more cooperative. And then the singer came around front, and she said, ladies, I don't know if you understand, but this gentleman is Fred Plotkin of the Metropolitan Opera, and he's written a magnificent book, and he is my boss, which was not in any way true that I was her boss. If anything, she was my boss. And she said, there are 50 copies here, and I encourage each one of you to buy one of the copies. It's holiday time, and I'm going to buy the other 45 and give them. This will be my holiday gift. And she said, if you wish, ladies, in addition to Mr. Plotkin's signature, which is very valuable, I'll be glad to put mine in, too. Wow. And they looked at her and they, they knew that she was someone outstanding, but they didn't quite know who it was. And I said, ladies, this is Lane Teen Price. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And she said. Well, it's an honor. She always would say, it's an honor. It's an honor to be with you, ladies. And it's an honor that you get to meet Mr. Plotkin and have him cook for you. So why don't you buy two copies each, one for you and one to give as a gift? Wow, <laughs> how do you say no to that? And then she went around the back and she did this again, the gesture of stand up, rise, be proud, give your best. It was, she, it was magnificent as an experience. And she taught me, I mean, she taught me many things all the time and I adore her, but that one experience about even if you're working for a tough crowd of only five people, you bring your best and you do your best because you just don't know. And then she really did buy all the books that those women didn't. Each woman bought two books and I had 50. So Leontine Bryce bought 40 books and made it her holiday gift. I signed them all. And yeah. So <laughs> talk about that. This what a story. <laughs> now that's a story that needs to be written somewhere. And I still have the photograph. I have the poster because that was my first public uh, appearance as an author. And I still have the poster here in my home of me that day. And wow. yeah, so you don't need for me to be told this because I've seen you on the opera stage and you have that on the opera stage gloriously but bring it to the publishing space is all i can say oh, I, I, will. Ask you, I, I will treasure that i want to ask you the title i love the title odyssey of an african opera singer odyssey is a strong word and it's the first word and i know from publishing that the first word of a title is the one that conditions everything that follows so yeah. i wanted my book to be pasta diva because it was pasta I wrote Opera 101, it's opera. And Odyssey is a great word, but it's a very weighted word that has all kinds of implications. How did that title come to be? Well, what had come to my mind first was actually something simpler like journey. Yeah. And then when I was discussing with Miss Wilson from Iowa, she said, you know, based on what you've written when, when we self-published, based on what you've written, it's, you're still too young, but what you've had to deal with already is heavy. And journey is just, it cheapens that. Also, there are too many books with journey in them. So we have to look for something peculiar that still talks about, describes what you, you have been through. And it gives, as you say, one word that gives a reader an idea that, okay, here, we're about to deal with some serious stuff. But then she said, I don't want the book to be negative and weighty all the time. So in the beginning, you do say what has happened, but at the end, you must give people hope. And that's what then the, um, the editor would say to her. She said, yeah, you've already talked about, told us of how heavy it was, but also there were some lighter moments. So show us which is why then in the book, the, the one that was published in 2018, I will talk about stories when we fought. She said, don't just say we fought with friends, show us, because you fought every weekend, sometimes for fun, sometimes not for fun, show us. Or you have stories about 
you know, trying to date girls and failing gloriously. Tell us, show us. And so she would mix that. Uh, so the Odyssey was just not just the journey then, but all these things. So Miss Nielsen, I would credit her with this. She's the one who came up with the word. She said about Odyssey. And she really was persuasive in saying, I think that's the, that. And even the one then, because now it's just Odyssey of an African opera singer. When we self-published through Amazon, it was Odyssey of an African opera singer from Zwede to the world stage. But when, when then we, I found a publisher, I, I said, I'm giving up all the rights, career rights and all that, you publish it. And, and we, we change some of the things and whatever you think is going to work, I give you permission. So that's how it works. But we kept Odyssey. And I, for, for some reason, it's really heavy because I was thinking at some point, I did read the Odyssey, Homer, and I watched, there was a, a mini series that came in the 90s with, I forgot his name, is Italian. Um, he's American, but Italian-American. Uh, Amant, Amant Asante. Yes. So, and, and there was that, and I loved that, but I realized his life was heavy. I mean, the, the Odysseus, you know, to go to the war for 10 years and then suddenly get lost. So that's quite one. So I was like, wait a minute, my life has heavy moments, but it's really not as heavy as dealing with literal monsters on sea and having left your family and all this. She said, no, but our Odysseus can be different. But also because to me, implicit in the original, in the Homer, is the concept of coming home. And yeah. I think that that is an element of your story. Whether it's physically coming home or coming home in other ways, we were talking before about when you are outside of South Africa, the way you, in a heightened way, experience a lot of the sensorial things that are South African. Yeah. And linguistic, perhaps, as well. The but language. Did, yes, we, I forgot to mention the, the language, the just different languages, the taxi drivers, and they are the conductors when they curse and swear at you while driving. That's that's the first thing. When, when you, you say get conductors, to, I think you mean railway conductors, not maestro. <laughs> <laughs> I mean railway conductors, and I also mean in the in the... Well, you can have some conductors who can catch oh, yes. you, but that's a different story. <laughs> but I'm talking about railway conductors also. The, we also use conductors for, in, in the taxi minivans in South Africa, they have 14 or 16 seaters. But there's usually a, someone we call Garji. That's an African's word, but that's, that, that's a conductor. So they collect the fee from everyone else. Okay. And they are the ones through the window of the minivan, you know, calling out the places. If we're going from, say, I don't know, uh, the 20, 20th and 5th Avenue and going up, we're going to Harlem, you'll have someone out the window of the taxi minivan calling all the stops. Harlem, 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 we have space for Harlem, Harlem. And then he's calling people sometimes swearing at them, especially if like <laughs> they're busy with their phones. And then he says some, you know, curse words, the explicitives, but he still wants their business. So they are characters <laughs> by themselves. They wake up as early as four in the morning, right? Get dressed, I mean, wash, get dressed. And they're always sharp, you know, smoke and drink their coffee. It's like that. That's another thing that's so peculiar to South Africa. I've never seen anywhere else. The conductors, the garches who curse you out, who fight with the women and other people in, in, the, in the taxis. Very, yeah. I forgot that part. In London, I don't know how old you were when you first went to London, but I was 17 and then I studied in London. And it used to be that on the double-decker buses, there would be the driver, but then there would also be the fare collector, very often from the Caribbean. And yeah. they spoke in a very rich, beautiful accent and with gorgeous voices. And they had this device that they would turn around, around, around and would emit a sort of tape depending how far you were going and you would put coins in there and there were shillings and farthings back then. And um, they would go up and down and up and down and they would lean out with the pole because the bus would take off and they would call out the stops well before we all had printouts that told us things. Yes. A similar experience. 
Yes, and now oh, I, I've I've seen some movies and read on that, but by the time I, first time I came to London already, there was now the the oyster system. I've okay. been uh, there have been cases where on the regional rail, you'll see the conductors and collecting money and and whatnot. I mean the fare fare takers, but on now the regular buses in London proper or the tubes or even the overground. They have the automated system where they call out everything from the bus yeah. and you see the signs and they no longer accept cash. Yeah. So you have the Oyster card. You can only go to um, a- any station to put the money or you can go to these off licenses and daily stores, some of them, then you can buy the Oyster card, but it's all cashless. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you, you, you hardly see them, though there have been cases where I've been on a bus where someone not even wearing their uniform just comes up and shows you an ID and says, show me your oyster. Then they've got a machine where they test the oyster to see if it's still valid. Yeah. If it's not valid, then you're in trouble. But I don't think not as much uh, as much as you are in trouble if you are, say, in Austria or Germany. That will yes. cost you 60 euros immediately yes. or 80 euros. Yeah. Yes. Um, we have a similar thing, although not as much enforced in New York City on the Metro card for the simple reason that you can't get past the turnstile without a card, a valid card. So I know in London, I have an Oyster card as well, that it's a different system. Since we're talking about London, you are in London right now. Yes. And you are appearing at the English National Opera. It's so nice to be able to say to some of my guests, you are now appearing in. I had Latanya Moore recently and she is in fire shut up in my bones at the Met in New York, which has its international HD broadcast tomorrow. Um, I've spoken to a couple of other people who are working and you are, thank God, working right now at the English National yeah. Opera in London. What are you doing? We're doing Satyagraha by Philip Glass and uh, a Faye McDermott production, which was actually um, a co-production with the Met. Yes. I think they premiered it here in 2007 the planning might have started as early as 2004 and it's now the fourth revival of it. And I'm doing now h- here it with Sean Panica, who's from uh, Pennsylvania, but I think of him more now from Michigan because he's a Michigan guy. I was about but to say, I think of him from Michigan. Yeah. So I, I, you you when appeared I spoke with to Sean him, this summer, we're going to get to this in a moment, but you were, you appeared with Sean this summer at the Salzburg festival in yeah. Intoleranza, which I saw on video because of the pandemic, I'm not going to Austria, unfortunately, right now. But um, we'll talk about that later. But it's an interesting thing when artists join up in different cities and different productions. In your case, in Sean's case, the very prestigious Salzburg and now London. Yeah. Um, he plays Gandhi, if I'm correct. He does, yes. And Sean is of South Asian background. I believe Sri Lanka, but I'm not certain. Yes, yes, you are. His parents actually were born in Sri Lanka. Okay. His older brother was born in Sri Lanka, but he, Sean, was born in America. So you and I are hair challenged. Sean yes. has this gorgeous head of hair. Did he shave his hair to do Gandhi? Oh, yes. Oh, oh yes. Uh, Sean. Uh, and <laughs> he was saying, he was saying, um, you know what? The shaving is not problematic. It's now it's when the hair has to go back. back. <laughs> that he has to deal with that somehow is so uneven. I said, just stay bald, man. He said, no, I still need my hair if I'm doing Don Jose and any of these other roles that he does. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> and I, evidently, I think I may be wrong on this, subject to correction. It, it, it's possible that it's the first time an Asian American or an Asian background singer is actually doing the role of Gandhi in this so. opera. Yeah. Yeah. So he did it in LA 2018. And so now he's doing it here, which is quite a big deal. And I love that dude. We we first worked together um, in 20, let me think. Is it 2016? Yes. With Eric Owens uh, uh, and John Demain in Washington, DC. Tazel Thompson was directing the the the, the Cat Vile musical slash opera based on Cry the Beloved Country. Lost in the Stars. Lost in the Stars. Yeah. So we did that. He was the narrator there. I was covering Eric and also part of the ensemble. 
And so I got to perform every night because I was in the ensemble as well. And, and then we worked again in Pittsburgh. Was it 2018? It could be where we did Moby Dick, uh, Jake Hagee, but the new production, the Christian McIntyre production, mm-hmm. which I, we had premiered in Utah with a different um, cast. And then I did with him in, in Pittsburgh. And of course I'd done the other one, which Stephen Costello and, and Jay Hunter Morris had premiered in Dallas. And your character, and which I saw in Dallas, is your character pronounced Quig Quig? Quig Quig? Quig Quig. Quig Quig. It's Quig-quig. like a South African name. <laughs> yeah, it's it's supposed to be um, a Pacific Islander. So yeah. I think that's why it could fit in. But it, I was there were other people of Samoan descent and Maori descent that I've worked with in the production. It was so cool working with them, them giving me pointers. And of course, I love the tattoos. But uh, so yeah, I worked <laughs> with Sean there and now I was counting with so it's now the fourth production we've worked yeah. together in. And well, I'm like, man, I'm stalking you. you have sort of a, let's say, unspoken relationship with a, a fellow artist on the stage, I mean, in terms of shorthand, in terms of communication that happens live in performance with one another. I think, you know, it helps a lot if you're working with someone like Sean, where even before you start the staging discuss some things with the director and all that, you've had some kind of rapport. So then I understand his gestures. We, we can discuss the two of us, how our roles interact and all that. It becomes so easier because we may not be best of friends, but we are friendly towards each other. We love each other, we respect. It makes it really, and imagine, it, uh, it's even more important for people who play romantic characters, right? And so then you have uh, someone like Philip McDermott, who is a hands-off kind of a director, who says, I'm looking at the bigger pictures, the big scene. He's a cynic director. Like, I think, like Debussy and all those people are all about colors and whatnot. So it's up to you as performers to be engaged. So at the beginning of each rehearsal, we sit down in a circle of chairs. He's got a stone. This time he had um, uh, what he called to clean your hands. Uh, hand sanitizer? Hand sanitizer. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's what he had now because he said because of COVID. So he would apply it in his hands, talk, and then send it, or give it to someone else next to, and then we did the same. Uh, but he used to have a, a, a this stone where you say, you say whatever you want to say. And you, and also you, you, are, you have freedom to, to not say a word. You can say, hello, I'm so-and-so, and then pass. And so that, we call it check-in. We have to check in. It means if, even if you might have had a load that day or the night before, you come to rehearsal, you say, okay, today this is a safe space. I feel that it's a heavy day and all that, this and that. And you have people that are not judgmental who are accepting of your situation. Just that alone helped all of us to connect because everyone is looking forward to the check-in. Before mm-hmm. we even start, we have 30 minutes of just talking about different things. Then Philip would have the last word where he talks now about his concepts of, for instance, Gandhi, Gandhi being the person who was all about pacifism and so forth, and then tie all of that in. And then he would talk about what he expects, but he says, whatever you do is right. So if you're supposed to make a gesture with your right hand, you forget you make it with your left hand, don't ever stop to think, oh, I should have done that. No, it's right. And then if you think you want to fix it later, you can always review it later, but you can't be stuck in what you are supposed to do because now it stops the action of what's supposed to continue. It's the same with singing. If I'm singing and I crack a note, I can't be stuck in that cracked note because there's other phrases that are coming. Otherwise, I'm late. Mm-hmm. The performance is stopped. So it's interesting how he's been able to combine philosophical things with, with singing and just all these things without trying to be a philosopher. I think and he's a wonderful director, and I love oh, the way I he love integrates the visual style that's uniquely yeah. his with yeah. the practicalities of stage direction and lighting and, and all of that and finding your mark, so to speak, finding your place 
vis-a-vis -vis the conductor, vis-a-vis -vis the cast members, his productions are very fluid. And yeah. I've had this summer, I had Michelle de Young in August and Latanya Moore very recently in October, um, both of whom appeared in that Aida. And we've spoken at length about that Aida. And I, so I refer viewers to back to those two sessions, but also um, you played Amonastro, yes. am I correct? And yes. therefore the father of Aida and therefore the king of Ethiopia. And I spoke with Latanya about the fact, and also Michelle, that the famous triumphal scene was full of coffins of all the dead yes. Egyptians coming back. And to me, apart from, say, a Zeffirelli type spectacle, it was the most impressive triumphal scene I've ever seen in Aida because it's what war is really about and that we don't really confront so vividly in opera. Um, yeah. I, I love that part too, but I, we, you, in fact, he warned us. He said, there are people who are expecting elephants because they've seen elephants and I'm not a traditional opera director. And so there are some people who are going to look at all these confluence of things and they say they don't fit in and they're not going to like the fact that the triumphant scene doesn't look triumphant because traditionally it's done a certain way. And he said, I'm just going to go with Verdi's mindset of what he was thinking. Well, it's war. How do you interpret war? There are people who die in war. They, so we're going to bring in coffins. I thought that was powerful. I was lucky enough to do the role, I, not the same role, but I was now doing the role of the king of Egypt this time. A, and Reggie, Reginald Smith Jr. was doing uh, Amon Azro. And that same production, we're doing it in Houston. It started December 2019 until February, of course, a month before all hell broke loose. And I, I just had even more of an appreciation of how he works. And of course, he had um, another guy who was an assistant to that production who was now doing more of the placement, but yeah. Philip would come and just talk. Even here we had Peter, who is a revival director, who's more your traditional opera director, but also understanding Peter. So he knows, move there, do that. We want to change, let's do that and all that. Then Phelim comes with all the philosophical disposition and all that. When, when we started, because we were starting from a, a fresh uh, with that AIDA, it, it was a challenge for many reasons that he was looking at the pictures that we didn't understand and didn't see. And we're all coming back from a background of we're an opera, we're opera singers. We usually deal with traditional directors who say, hey, move this. When you say this, what are you saying? And all that. Phelim was like, ah, nah, ah, that's your business, what you're saying to each other. I'm more interested in the, uh, the relationship from a different perspective. And so, yeah, I, 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 I would love to see the, the interviews both with Latana and Michelle. I'll send them to you. First, because at first it was uneasy until we understood how he worked. But I think that's what eventually even builds those great relationships. When at first there's maybe a little bit of friction because you don't understand one another. You're trying to see how, not compromise, how to accommodate mm -hmm. someone else. And, and he's just lovely. So now I, I get to work with him for the third time in two productions. It's just wonderful. I want to ask you one more thing about that Aida production. You said you played the King of Egypt in Houston. And yes. therefore, the attitude of the King of Egypt, someone who sent everybody to war and sees the coffins come back, is very different from the captured King of Ethiopia, Amonazro, yes. who was brought in as part of the, the spoils of war. And it's... It, you play a very different role, but frankly, you have to react differently as the king of Egypt, or I think you would not yes. have to. You would react differently as the king of Egypt. How did you experience that, playing that role of the king of Egypt in Houston, in that production? The interesting part is that Amonazro doesn't have any relationship with Horamphis or these people because he's captured. So he's there on a mission pretending to be some captain within the Ethiopian army, but he reveals himself then later on to Radames. And then, of course, uh, the priest and the soldiers come in 
but by then it's, it's too late. So it was different because you know you have, you have a mission. And yet with the king, at the beginning of the opera, there's this relationship now where you are governing and behind the scenes that we would get to see the, the king before the triumphant scene, before they even go to war. And then we see him again after the, the, the triumphant scene. So what helped was that now I had to understand Rumphis was actually an instigator. Mm-hmm. It's interesting how much these priests are, powerful were, uh, to instigate things. And so I, I love that. I love that. And uh, Peijing Shen was playing the, the role of the Rumphis, wonderful Chinese bass. And, and I could yeah. feed off him. And, and now with, then working with Maestro, or, or Patrick Summers, he's such an intellectual and understands the music. And he's also the type of conductor who goes deeper into the music and the meaning of the words, what Verdi was thinking about, because he does the research, which then made me think quite a lot about the relationship that you are governing now. What's happening? How do you feel? Obviously, there's anxiety in the beginning that the Ethiopians are attacking, so we must defend ourselves. Then, now the, after then, I see these people captured, and even some of my own people are begging me to let them go. I say, well, you let them go. Of course, I, I don't know if that's a monastery I'm releasing. I don't think if he, he knew that it was a monastery, he would have still you'd released him. So I, it's lovely, and I, 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 I wonder sometimes if I were to get an opportunity to play Ramfis, although Ramfis is more, much of, more of a bass role, he, so he does go low, I would have to, I don't know, find low notes to do that. <laughs> it would be an interesting, if I, uh, interesting thing if I got to do that role as well, to have a totally the different Verdi perspective. Is my absolute hero is a man. And I think he was a brilliant dramatist and composer, of course, and editor. But I think he made a little bit of an error in this opera, Aida. Um, In the scene in the second act where Aida, um, and actually the libretto is by Ghislanzoni, but Verdi could have corrected it. Um, She says very much out loud, O cel mio padre. You don't and, do that. And he says, non mi tradir, don't give me away. Well, it's a little late. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because if she were to say that pianissimo to herself, maybe, but it's just sung out, oh, ciao, mio padre, don't mi tradir. And, <laughs> and the interesting part is that, does it mean that other people don't hear this exchange? That's what I wonder about. And I wish I had Verdi here to ask him because... His instincts were perfect. So I know that he knew what he was doing. And maybe I'm just not getting the subtlety of that. But if I were directing it, and if I were coaching the singers doing it, I would have it sung and directed differently. Like maybe he would be right next to her. Oh, tell me, Padre, no me tradir. Don't give so me away. In, the, in, that, in that film, uh, McDermott's production, uh, Amonazro and the other Ethiopian prisoners are in this cage. And Aida, yes. because she, Ethiopian, she recognizes that, wait a minute, these are my people. And for some reason, she's trying to check because she doesn't know whether her father is dead or not. She thinks her father is dead, so she's checking. Then she sees him. She gets close to him in this um, cage. She's like, Chell, my father. And she's like, don't. So it works better there because even though the audience here's what she says, it's staged in such a way that other people don't recognize this. And I just saw but something it else. it does beg a question on why. Yeah. Verdi, yeah. But I just saw something else. In London at the English National Opera, you sang it in English. In Houston, you must have sung it in Italian. Oh, yes. So oh, how yes. did that suddenly feel different? You're having sung an Italian language opera. We understand ENO does works in English and fine. But if you form, because this gets back to our original conversation about how language influences our thinking and our behavior, depending what the language is, if you experience that opera in English as a performer, and then you experience it in its original Italian as a performer, what's different for you apart from the linguistics? I I learned it in Italian first. I remember then I even auditioned for a company in the US. Well, 
And I, at that time, I don't think I was ready for the role, I, but I wanted it so badly. And I, I was auditioning. Oh, I, I was, we were rehearsing something within the same opera, and then they gave me a chance to audition for them, for this. So after rehearsals, I was a little tired, but I sang for, for them in any case. And it just wasn't good, especially when you get to, I sang the part, uh, it just wasn't mm -hmm. there. I, myself, I, I, I could feel it. But I, and then I said to myself, I'm just going to learn and learn. It. And I spent so much time so that I would be comfortable because I'm a bass baritone and Amonazo is a baritone. It's not that high because I can sing it, but you still need to be comfortable. But I learned it in Italian and I understood it in Italian. And Verdi, when he wrote even the pitches, he thought of it in Italian. Yeah. The challenge then was when you're going to do it in English, it has to be changed a bit so that it, it's not just um, uh, the, the, the English you sing from Sherma, but it has to be English that is more like you are writing it in the original language. Here's the thing. Some of the high notes were set up in a certain way so the vowels then change, especially in the duet between Amonazro and, well, in the whole opera, but the, the duet between Amonazro and the third act and then Aida. Uh, <laughs> in English, it sounds different. So we had to work on those, on how we can find an English word that would have the same vowel or something closer without changing the meaning. But also in that uh, duet, there in Italian, it's a challenge. I've coached this role a lot. Rividrai le foreste balsamate. Oh. With the R's, the mouth is closed. Rividrai le foreste balsamate. Le fresche valli. Everything is closed. And, but you as a singer have to do it more you open. You have to open, yeah. How do you do that? Well, first I had to do it slowly. So that also, because I've now been in the U.S. for a while, and I had been even by then, where I have to check myself that the R's are not like the, the usual rah, rah R's that we say in America. <laughs> re, it's not re, re, and all those. And I remember working with Kamal Khan. He would say, uh-uh, you've been here too much. Slow down, man. So I had to learn to do it first, just working on the words. Slowly, even not taking the, the tempo that is there, a slower tempo, longer uh, vowels just for me to get it within my body. And then by the time you do it fast, you've already worked on it. So it becomes like second nature. It took a while though, like for months, because I was like, this is Verdi. I respect Verdi. There are so many roles in Verdi that I want to do roles that I know that, oh, this is going to take time. A case in point, Regoletto is my ultimate Verdi role I'd love to do, but that is not child's play. Uh, that is a kind of role I believe that you, have, you, you should have been singing it before singing it. That is coaching it, going through it with small portions of it over years, so that when you say, now I'm ready for it, the body has been used to doing it for years. I can't just wake up tomorrow and say, I'm going to do Regoletto and I only have five months to learn it, where the body is going to say, um, uh, yeah, I'm going to challenge you. And that's why the first time I auditioned for Amonazro, the body was not ready. And so now I know whenever I'm, I say I'm, I'm tempting to audition for a role, it's a role that I can sing, that I'm ready, where someone can say, yeah, tomorrow I can hire you for it. Unless they say to me, hey, Musa, would like for you to consider doing Dutchman. We are thinking maybe in four years time. Can you learn a little part, maybe the last part with those high, high E naturals so that we, we can hear if you can sing them or not. Then you do it. Then you know, okay, I have now four years to go through this. In fact, in you, fact you I was going to say to you that I see a flying Dutchman in your future, but but I, let's, I want to go back to a person you mentioned. Would you tell our audience who the wonderful Kamal Khan is? He's a very special guy. He's a friend of mine. But you describe him because he's, he's really important in the opera world and not everyone knows him. Kamal Khan is actually from Virginia originally. So let's say Virginia, D.C. area. But many people know him. Those who know him 
as someone from New York because he's been in New York for many years. He was one of those pianists who were who, at the Met who worked with uh, the deceased Maestro Levine. And so he was a repetitor, he played um, some rehearsals, he coached and sometimes worked with composers and all that. But he, in his own right, is not just a pianist, he's also a conductor. So at some point he worked at Palm Beach as a chorus master and conductor. And then he started spreading his um, uh, wings. He ended up getting contact with people in Cape Town and with Angelo Cobato. Angelo Cobato is the retired professor of opera at the University of Cape Town. He's the guy who recruited me when I went there to study. And I was under him for uh, four years before then Kamal took over. And I would work with Kamal for two years before I, I came to AV. So Kamal and I developed this great relationship of coach and, and someone I can I can send my message and say, hey, I need advice on this. Or if I'm in New York, I need to work on a role. I would work with Kamal. If, cause, if of course, I'm in Philadelphia, I would work with Laurent or I'd work with Luke Hausner or David Loftin at AVA. But if I'm in New York, sometimes I'd say, yeah, Laurent is not available, but Kamal is available. And especially for, if it's Verdi, I remember I coached with Kamal in Verdi because I, he understands Verdi quite well and he knows my voice. And he is the one who told me that because you have a bass baritone, then you have to adjust without compromising your core. And so we worked for months on that. By the time then I went to ENO, English National Opera, I'd been working at it for two years. Um, so Kamal is actually in China, Hong Kong, China now. I don't mm. know what he's doing. I should have asked him. He said he's in quarantine there. It's a 21 day quarantine. So he had only spent seven days. I think it's nine days now. So there's still more days before he can be able to work there. So he does a lot of collaborations now. He works a lot with Nadine Sierra. Mm -hmm. He works with Pretty Yende, amongst other people. Michael mm -hmm. Fabiano as well. Um, so yeah, so Kamal, I've known him the first time we worked. I actually was covering the role of Antonio in Linoce de Figaro in 2006 in Cape Town. Then he came back in 2000. <laughs> That's a funny role for you. <laughs> oh, it is funny. It's funny role. It's, that's just a drunkard. I love that. Then he came back in 2008. We worked on Don Giovanni. That was the first time I did Laborello. And that was my first role in school. And my just first, first uh, significant role. So we coached on that. It was the time we came from New York just to work on the residence before we started and to give us a ballpark on how to prepare the residence. Fortunately, both he and Maestro Angelo Cobalto, who's Italian, and like you, they understand Italian. And both of them are singers, pianists, conductors, director, who have an intimate understanding of Verdi and well-read on Verdi so, or Mozart, so we're lucky. So, yeah, Kamal is that person. And I'll point out... the degree to which he's very important to opera in Cape Town in South Africa. I'm going to have a guest in a few weeks from Cape Town. So uh -huh. we're going to talk about the company very specifically, but I wanted to, since you mentioned Kamal, I wanted to mention him briefly in this context. Um, you mentioned Eric Owens before, who I think is just wonderful and a role model, and he lives in Philadelphia, he's yeah. from Philadelphia. Um, does my memory serve that when you were a finalist in the Metropolitan Opera National Council competition, which you won, by the way, you were one of the winners, on March 10th, 2013, that it was Eric who was calling out the winners? Yes. And I remember very well, because I, I in my program, I noted the five people I thought should win, and you were one of them. And he attempted to pronounce your last name. And then he said, oh, come on out, brother. You know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> he failed dismal. He's like, you know who you are. Come on out, man. <laughs> or he tried, but he just he just failed. And I, <laughs> that's how I knew. Because I, I, I also, I didn't know. I, I, I had no inclination. I thought we, we made it to the semifinals and there's 20 people. Then I look around. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm the only non-American now here in the mm -hmm. top 20. I was like, this is good enough. Then when we made it to the finals, so 10 people now making it to the finals, I was like, okay, 
Lord can t- take me now. I, I will now be able to perform on the stage with that orchestra and there'll be 4,000 people. And then there's going to be a broadcast sometime on radio. So I'm cool. Whether I win or not, it doesn't matter to me. I think a lot of people are going to see me, agents and so forth, because at the time I was still searching. And and so that, that was quite an experience. And then if so when he, they called a number of people, then out of the the other two winners, which is, was me and Sydney Mancasola, yes, they didn't call our names that. I looked at Sydney. I yeah. was like, there is no way, because we thought it was just going to be five winners. Traditionally, it's five winners. That year, was there were six of us. So I looked at Sydney. I was like, there is no way I'm winning before Sydney. Sydney is winning this, and I'm happy for her. So when he tried to pronounce my name and butchered it, and I was like, you know who you are. I was like, <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> and... A part of what caught my ear about you, apart from the beautiful voice and the beautiful singing, was what you sang. Because I'll be blunt, I go to many competitions. I've been a judge in competitions. You tend to get the same number of arias all the time. Depending on the voice category, you can expect a certain type of singer to sing a certain aria. And that's okay, but then you're judging against the memory of other people doing that, or let's say professionals. For example, every young blonde woman with a big voice wants to sing Dies Toyota Halle from Tannhäuser. Yeah. And I've heard Leonie Riesenek, and I've heard Deborah Voigt, and I've heard great singers, Jesse Norman, do that role so that I, they're competing with my memory, even if I'm able to separate the reason X Normans and, and voids yeah. from the woman in front of me. You sang from an opera that I really love that really the only person doing it was Jose Van Damme and then Ferruccio for Lanetto, namely yeah. Massenet's Don Quixote, which is a wonderful opera. And how did you get to that aria, which is an old man role basically, and you were a young man? We, interesting enough, we actually did that at AVA. Mm. We did that at AVA before I came to the Met, like a, a month. In fact, when I was at the Met, they were still continuing with performances of Don Quixote at AVA. And of course, I had seen Forolendo do it in San Diego. And I had never thought that a few years later would do it. In, but at AVA, there was um, a, someone who sponsored, who wanted a, a specific sponsor who wanted that opera, I think. So, and then they, I think Crystal Williams, I think she might be in Birmingham now or Leeds, if I'm not mistaken. She was, she was going to do Dulcinea. Patrick Getty uh, was going to do, I, I would do Sancho and Patrick Getty was going to do Quixote and exchange with uh, Burak Bilgili and I would be paired with Zach Nelson. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, but then I entered the competition and it was not the first time I entered it, but the first time now I made it all the way to the semifinals. And Patrick Getty is the one who filled the application form for me. Yeah. And mm-hmm. then said, now you're going to, we're going to send it, man. Because the, I had done it before and went nowhere. I think as far as DC and I was like, ah, I don't want to do any more competitions. So Patrick Getty is the one who forced me because I filled it in. And you better do it, otherwise I'll be mad at you. So mm-hmm. I ended up doing it. And they said, now you owe me because you've won, because I'm the one who did that. <laughs> so that's, then we, we learned the role. I was coaching with Maestro Makatsoris all throughout December on that. And I thought, wait a minute. When I sang all the other rounds, I sang just the regular uh, Leporello and other stuff. But I noticed that in the semifinals, there were two people who were singing the same aria. Uh, Aliyevko's Kapatina, mm-hmm. Rachmaninov. Then I I noticed that Brandon Sidel and myself was doing Vira Viso from La Sonambula, but he was not doing the Kabaletta, it's just the Kapatina. Mm. I was like, okay. But I was like, if that's the case, then I need to, a second aria that nobody else is going to sing. I was like, I think that aria is strong enough. Whether I win or not, it doesn't matter. As long as I feel great about it, that's that. Then behind the scenes, I mean, there was a case of, are there parts for it or not? I was like, well, yeah. they're doing it, so they'll have parts. 
I was bold. My fact. parts, you mean the orchestral scores. Yeah, the orchestral yeah. parts. Mm -hmm. Then there was like, okay, also for La Sonambula, we don't have the parts for this. The, the last time we did it, we, we skipped some of the, I said, I don't care whatever parts you have, we're going to do that. They said, why don't you just sing only the, the cover dinner like Brandon? I said, no, I don't want to like Brandon is doing his stuff and I'm doing my stuff. Then they said, how about you change and do, I don't know, Figaro. I said, no, I don't want to Figaro. I want to do this one. And I, I felt at some point I was like, I am going to be one of those obstinate singers. But I'm like, well, if I lose, at least I lose knowing that I've, I've sung what I wanted to sing. Because I'd seen a situation like that before another singer from AVA who also had to sing someone else, what someone else was singing. So he had to change and he didn't win. I was like, no, nope, that's not going to be me. So I stuck to my guns and thankfully Gay Letha supported me, Gay Letha Nichols, who was Gay the Nichols, yeah. The, yeah. And so that area then I the way it just sounded with that orchestra, I felt great about it. I was like, then whatever happens, that's how I chose that because we did it at AVA and I felt confident because we had been coaching with my stomach for months on that. And um I had I didn't do the opening. Performance. I only performed in Bucks County, the last mm -hmm. performance, because AVA, they would do performances in Philadelphia, go to Haverford to perform for patrons, there, and then do the last performance in Bucks County. Unfortunately, Zach Nelson had to do all the performances, and I was so sad about that, but it was a case of, I'm sad, but I'm happy at the same time. I'm sad that I can't be there, but I'm also happy because I'm, I'm at the Met. Well, that's yeah. the whole purpose of AVA, yeah. so that you can sing at the Met and elsewhere. Yeah. And the conductor at the Met was Marco Armigliato, who was wonderfully yes, flexible. Such a lovely guy, yeah. And, you know, basically anything you put in front of him, he can conduct. He's very, he has that Italian aspect of being able to adapt quickly to new circumstances. When they said there were no parts and all that, he said, well, let's show me what, look at the library, we'll conduct with what is there, we'll make it work, we'll yeah. write some things if it needs be. And that's what we did. Yeah. So, um, I want to go back a little bit to Satyagraha in part okay. because I love that opera, but also because what a lot of people don't know about Mohandas Mahatma Gandhi was that he lived a lot of his early life and formed his political outlook in South Africa, not India. Yeah. And I'm trying to think of the best way to define the word Satyagraha. It's like a life force, a life spirit. A political mission. How would you describe Satyagraha, which is sort of a there, creative there is, word? There are notes, but I it there are notes they've given here, but it's um they in the notes section they say it's the truth force. Truth force, yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I, I was thinking of more of like emancipatory force mm -hmm. but something that is liberating force that forces you to do that of course it's loosely translated from sanskrit yeah and uh and the 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 show itself satyagraha is not a biographical of opera so it's loosely translated from sanskrit and they take different um times within his life but yeah. also put the part of the some of the, the Hinduism beliefs. That's why you've got Krishna there in the beginning of the and very the whole story, story. Yeah. And I played Krishna. Yeah. So you have uh, Arjuna who is more the way it's set up in the story. He's like a, a spiritual younger and warrior-like part of Gandhi. Then uh, was played by this wonderful British baritone Ross Ramgobin. And then you've got Sean Panika who's doing playing Gandhi. And so Krishna is giving him this license to say, hey, yeah, I know you don't want to fight here. Yeah, I say, don't fight. You can go on with this journey. I bless you. So that's why Krishna only appears then in, in, in the first act. But it's not chronological. So mm -hmm. there's Tolstoy, there's Oz, there's, there's Martin Luther. Uh, so the different King parts. and Tagore, the great Indian writer. Yeah. And so they've put them together like yeah. that. It's, and so which makes each then each act different like that. Anyone near London now, I really encourage them to go see this because it's a great opera. 
with a great cast and a wonderful production by Fella McDermott that I saw in New York and, and really loved. Um, and now I want to go back to what we mentioned a little bit earlier, namely in Toleranza 1960 by Luigi Nonno, who was a very modern, I'll use a word that probably people won't like, un-Italian sounding composer for his music. Um, it sounded more like some of the contemporary German music that we would hear from 60 years ago. And I watched it in the summer when you were in it live. And then I watched it again yesterday to watch it again. And I'm not sure I know what it's about. And there were lots of people running about for much of the opera. It was, a very, it was like an athletic event. Um, people kept moving. And you played a character of someone who is tortured. I don't think he has a name. But the he's character, just called, yeah, the character is Un Torturato, the torture. Torturato. And Sean played, Sean Panikar played. Un Emigrante. The an immigrant. immigrant, a migrant. And yeah. then there was, um, I'm forgetting her name, a lovely mm -hmm. soprano with blonde hair who sang impossibly hard music. Leah, 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 Leah. Uh, who, the, the, the blonde, Sarah. Yeah. Sarah. Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. And then a friend of mine, Anna Maria Curie, played a woman. Yes. And therefore, when they don't necessarily have names, I mean, she's a woman, you are tortured, he's an immigrant. Um, the opera and the storytelling becomes about something else. And yeah. the music is hard to sing, I would imagine. It's very hard for the orchestra to play. It was conducted by Ingo Metzmacher. Would you talk about rehearsals and what you came to understand this work to be about? Well, you, I mean, I had read up on the work. I understand that it's about this migrant who's been working in these mines, but is no longer happy there. And he wants to go back home. Unfortunately, on his, en route to home, there's a strike, there's a protest. And the police mistake him as one of the protesters. So they take him take them to the police station and they start, you know, questioning them and torturing them. I mean, he eventually gets released and he abandons the first woman he was with. And then he meets another woman who's more like a narrator to the story. Mm -hmm. But also there's a flood where I, I don't know what Nono was motivated by, but it, I mean, it befits in 2021 where everyone dies from the flooding. And you could think of immigrants coming from uh, Syria and trying to, to get into Europe, you know, die by flooding or in the rivers or the sea. But that's the, 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 the nexus of the story. The reason you saw a lot of people running around was that the director was saying there's always a constant movement and confusion of migration where people are intolerant along the route. There had been discussions, even from some close friends who watched it, who felt that, yes, the, the walking and the concept moving, especially in the, the beginning of the second part, where it first starts with uh, Sarah, and she sings this lovely elevated part. After that, then everyone starts moving and running. It goes on for 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, there were people who felt that that could have been shorter on how it, it went about it. But Jan Laus, this Belgian director, had this idea that there's constantly going to be a movement. And as you saw, there were no sets, mm -hmm. except for those flashlights, floodlights. So the sets are us. And for the torture scene, he wanted to be as graphic as possible because in the music, Nono has actually explicitly written that there's 20 minutes of torture. Yeah. And you were the one <laughs> being tortured. Yeah. And so we have yeah. to work on that. So if, if it's going to come to 20 minutes of torture in performance time, you can imagine how long it takes to rehearse that part with mm -hmm. the dancers. And there, there were even some young dancers, especially dancers of color, even others who were triggered, you know, because you have to think about Black Lives Matter and all these other things. And so, but we had to sometimes sit down and just talk through things and say, today, no torture scene. Today we skip it, we do other parts and all that. So that was his idea that there's constant movement. And also he doesn't come from 
I think that was only his second opera. So it doesn't, it's not like your traditional opera director where in this scene you come and do your part, then you're gone. He said, everyone is involved from the opening until the end. So everyone is on stage for that whole hour and 45 minutes or something, mm-hmm. which you can understand when you rehearse is, uh, is yeah. challenging because you can't plan and say, hey, uh, yeah, we'll I'll see you for tea. No, <laughs> every time there's a rehearsal, you just know you'll be there for six hours. Mm-hmm. But I, that that production had an imprint on me because it was so physical, and and of course you work with those young actors and dancers that have so much energy, so you feed off of them. Uh, but yeah, that was my understanding. And then what would drive me is especially in the torture scene, once they've tortured you the actual Italian words of what he's saying. And so that then drove my drama. And well, in, this leads, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want to get right to, a, to two questions. One is, was it ever explored in rehearsal or in your own mind why he was being tortured? I mean, I unfortunately, in no. our world, people get tortured just for no, evil. No, we didn't have that like a time where you would have say, like the professor I've mentioned, Angelo Gobato, is your traditional Italian opera director, where each scene, that scene would have had time to sit and discuss that. But here it was more of an outward thing that everyone, okay, you're going to get tortured. Yes, you have your moment, so we have to see you because you have to sing and all that. And, and it has to be special how you are tortured because you have to stand out. Nevertheless, uh, we didn't go to those layers where, what am I saying to you? What are you saying to me in relation and all that? So we had to find our spaces like that. To his credit, he did give us freedom to say you can move however you want to move and all that, as long as it feels authentic. But it was more about the bigger picture of this migration, less about individuals. Um, the, the other productions, I don't know how many projects they've done. It would be interesting to see if another director does it on how they would approach it. But the interesting part is that, I mean, the performances, all of them were always full yeah. or close to full. And you had people who travel all over the world just for those kinds of performances. So to them, that, the music on its own. Fortunately, you had Ingo, who understands the music, who's passionate about the music, such that the orchestra, even though it was difficult to play at first and understand it, he, he wants it soft because they it's soft, even though you don't understand why it's soft there, but that's what he wants because that's what uh, Luigi Nono wrote. Therefore, the music I felt was balanced, at least from the orchestra. So my next question relates also to your role into the opera. It was sung in Italian. It was not always easy to understand the Italian because of the nature of the music and the way the Italian yeah. was set. Um, but there was speech in English. And because, as we now know about you, you care about language. You were the clearest in your English language speech, even though there are other native English speakers in the cast. And at a certain point, you, as your character, the tortured man, said, I can't breathe. Now, those are words we know from Eric Garner here in New York, who was tortured by police and yeah. by Elijah McClain in Colorado, and most famously, tragically, George Floyd in Minnesota. But this happens all too often, as we know. Were those words, I can't breathe, part of the opera, or were they inserted for this production? No, they were inserted for this production. They are mm-hmm. not there. Even the, the blind poet, the speech that was written, that was inserted. Yeah. When we're discussing it, he said, well, you know, you tell me how you feel. But he said, if we're going to talk about migrants and police brutality and all this, we can't just go by without acknowledging what has just happened or is happening. And he said, well, think about it. It may feel uncomfortable. And if you don't want to do it, I don't want you to do it. But we're discussing it. And there were even other dancers of color who felt strongly either for or against the idea. But he said, well, there's a torture. There are people doing that. It's going to trigger people, but I feel that it needs to be done. You can't do it all the time, but you need to find a moment where you do it. And for you, how do you feel about it? 
So we there was some debate that was really heated mm-hmm. because some dancers, especially, they said, no, we, we should not do this because it's triggering me. And so now you had to discuss a case of how do you balance real life and acting mm-hmm. without it actually affecting you. Even though you act, it does affect because you think of it. Yeah. But I had to dig deeper to think about the importance of what we are doing without allowing it to just get to me. Otherwise, you aren't able to, to sing or do anything. Mm-hmm. Also, I think it's just how I've been looking at all these things as far back as South Africa. There was a time where I said, there's a lot of horrible things that are happening. But I always ask myself a question at this point in time, what can I do about it without inviting it into my space? Where, for instance, I'm here now and chatting to you. There is no brutality happening around my vicinity. Someone else could be brutalized elsewhere. And I empathize and I sympathize. And if ever I can donate a dollar to a pause or write something to a senator, I know that I could do that. But how do I balance feeling that empathy and being able to live my life? Because it's very important. I, I Otherwise, then I, I'll, 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 you try to be this messiah who ends up being crucified because nobody is powerful enough to like take the sins of the world to, upon themselves yeah we're not the messiah so yeah. there's that i had then had to think about that and was talking in private with some of my colleagues about those things on how um you i'm not going to say don't take it personally because you it, it affects everyone but we have to find a way to channel it it's easy for people to say don't take it personally and that could be insulting to some people but i had to find words where you say hey it's already personal show. How do you find a way to channel the emotions into the performance? Um, so yeah, that with that that moment, it comes only once in the opera or that production, but it had come up a number of times where we discuss it behind the scenes. Yeah. Which I appreciated because the director also was saying, if anyone wants to say anything, please say it. it it's a space where you, you can say whatever you want to say. And if you uh, against it, please say it, and then we can discuss it. We can debate it. I, I kind of I like that. I think what you're pointing out in our conversation, whether it was the Aida, the Satyagraha, or Intolerance in 1960, is the amount of work that happens in rehearsal that audiences yeah. don't see. And I know many artists, singers, instrumentalists, and so forth, who prefer the rehearsal period of their careers to the actual performances. I know others who just love to get on the stage and play in front of a big audience in these works, but certain artists really go deep in the rehearsal period. I love attending rehearsals when I'm invited to do so, even if I'm not involved in the staging, because you see how the work happens. That's where you learn to. I, I found some things even with the singing, where there are some things I couldn't couldn't learn in, in a practice room or from it working with a teacher or a coach. Then you go to the rehearsal room. You're like, oh, how did you do that? You know, I remember watching Eric Owens in that production of Lost in the Stars. I'm like, how the hell does he do all those high notes? It doesn't even seem tired. And to him, it just seems like he's doing it, it comes easy. So he's, psst, psst, hey man, just show me how you did that and all that. The same for Morris Robinson, you were doing, um, what's this, early, early Verdi opera, Nabucco. In, Nabucco. I was doing the, the high priest of Baal, a smaller role. He was doing Zakaria. This brother is doing Zakaria, who has three areas and all these ensembles. He never marked a single rehearsal. I was like, no. <laughs> what? Morris is wonderful. So, Morris so, is anything you can sing, I can sing lower. <laughs> and then there was Sebastian Katana who was doing Nabucco. And I would just watched him, even the, the soprano and all that. And I was like, there's so much for me I'm learning on this rehearsal space, how people negotiate these turns 
So, oh, this doesn't work. I'm going to do that. They come back the following day. You can see they've been thinking and processing it. I was like, there's a lot to learn here, more than on that private room. Um, so I also appreciate it. Also, the, there was a colleague here in London who was part of the skills ensemble who was saying, you know, the interesting part is now you don't get to see people. As soon as the performance is, you know, open, it's there's no time to stop and think and whatnot. You just run. Obviously, it's not automatic because you have to adjust if there are mistakes and all that. You are there, but there's some part of like an automation going on. Whereas when we rehearse with time, tea breaks to sit and talk, to meet for coffee, to get to know people better. You have longer time. You're rehearsing for six hours each day or eight hours, depending where you work. You know, now six days of the week. Mm -hmm. Performances, they come, you start three hours, you come for your part. Uh, I'm in the first act, so I'm going to do the first act, come the second act, wearing some Krishna garb, then I'm done. Opening night, we do all the bows, but the rest of the performance is what am I waiting for? No, I'm gone once I'm done because you're doing a smaller part, right? Uh, but the rehearsal process, I, I used to, even when I remember I was in Toronto in 2000, and, was it 17? I think so. And I was doing the... Um, Angelotti and Tosca. Angelotti. And, and there, but the rehearsal process, they don't always call you, but then you have a chance sometimes to just come and see the Scarpia doing something and others. And that just gives you a chance to just watch other singers, the more experienced singers or older singers doing stuff. And then you watch, you learn, you get to talk to people, you add them on Facebook and Instagram, then somehow you get to meet them in other productions. So I value, I value the, the rehearsal process. That's why even with symphonies, I would always look at all the videos with uh, Von Karajan, where he did sometimes, especially when he was older, where it didn't seem that he was not even was like conducting at all. But like, how do they understand it? Then it dawned on me, the rehearsal process, where they spend so much time, they understand exactly what he wants. The performance is just show, like, let's go. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. For, the, for me, the, I appreciate more the rehearsal mainly because of what learning from other people and discovering new things about myself, the relationships you build with people. And then the performance, of course, I love because now the, the, there's an audience who's there dressed up, appreciating it. And finally, everything has come to fruition. So speaking of Herbert von Karajan, you are wonderful at transitions because I was going to then go to the list of choices in the Adagio catalog that you made because regular listeners know that I asked my guests to pick things that inspire them whether it's particular music or the performers doing it or both. And the first choice you gave me was the Brahms Symphony Number no. 1 with Herbert von Karajan conducting the Berlin Philharmonic. Why that work? Why those musicians? I love Brahms. I remember it's interesting that many people, when they learn uh, Deutsch Lieder, they would learn Schumann, Schubert, and all these others. The first ones I learned were by Brahms. I just felt that they were they easier for me for some reason. And of course, I knew that eventually I would want to do the Fear Insta Gazenga, the four serious songs, and which I did at some point for um, a recital. I even coached them in Ravinia with Kevin. And so... Kevin I Murphy? Said, Kevin Murphy, yes. Yeah. I coached with him <laughs> there. And he also played... Uh, Who's the... Planet Opera is a very small place, and we all kind of know each other. <laughs> yes, and he played he played gloriously for my semifinals at the Met. Okay. Yeah, because people don't see that. Most people don't see that. You only see the finals with the orchestra. But the, the preliminary rounds and all that, you've got all pianists. And the semifinals, you, do, you have some invited guests, but it's not open. Mm -hmm. So you have a number of pianists there. And so I worked with him and um, Carrie Ann Matheson, who's now in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's such a small world. It and is. So, but, so, so, and I had worked with him on Brahms. So Brahms, and I remember my very first concert in Cape Town when I was a student, or say, I was still a student, but doing something semi-pro, was uh, the Brahms a German Requiem, mm. which I did with Pretty Yen there. Mm. And with the Cape Town Philharmonic Orchestra. 
Mm. And we did it in Cape Town and in Stellenbosch and elsewhere, three different places. Stellenbosch being the wine district, yes? The wine district, yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> and, and so I fell in love. You know, I still remember the, the opening line. Her liebe doch mich. You're like, oh, what's that? And I just, I just fell in love with Brahms. So I had seen a number of like symphonies and all that, of course, Tchaikovsky and whatnot. And then when you read how long it took Brahms to write that, because he was also, he felt unworthy to write a symphony when you had Beethoven. And of mm -hmm. course, in the, in, in the fourth uh, movement, he does make uh, kind of like, hey, I see you, Beethoven, and uh, an ode to him. But the beginning of that, I, I've, I've listened to many symphonies. I, I don't know if ever there's any symphony that starts as that powerful. There's just some longing. I'm not sure whether it's sadness and all that. The big drums, which he loved. And then the, just the, the strong strings as if they are disappearing into some ether. That, and of course, the Berlin Philharmonic and von Karajan, which in my opinion, I would think of a maestro Leonard Bernstein as the Mahler uh, pro and specialist. But I would think Brahms, other conductors can play Brahms. But von Karajan... No, I, for me, that's, that's the... I'm going to give you one other Brahms conductor people don't think of, Carlo Maria Giulini. Ah. He does wonderful, did wonderful work with Brahms. Worth exploring if you like Brahms. Yes. And I'm not disputing Vagarian, but I think another very valid interpretation is Giulini. Wow. Of course, Abado too, I love him there. And also his Beethoven. Yes. Right. Claudio Abado. But I remember when I hearing that with the um, Berlin, I was like, oh, my goodness. It's just. Well, you remember when else. I said to you earlier that, in effect, Leontine Price was my boss. Yes. In fact, Claudio Abado was my boss. Wow. So he I love many conductors. He's just up here. And then all these other wonderful conductors are there. Abado was just that one extra little bit that goes right to my heart in terms of his and music. also I, I never met him but people who've met him said he was just a very nice guy he was you could see the rapport with the orchestra to how they yeah. responded to him so speaking of um italian repertory two of your favorites that you listed were especially a duet from puccini's madama butterfly vieni la sera um because i think you told me it's, you think it's the most beautiful love duet in opera yeah so you won't get to sing it, unfortunately, because it's a no. tenor and a soprano. No, unfortunately, but the the trio at, uh, towards the end. If if ever I would be crazy enough to want to do shuffles one day, if I would be crazy <laughs> enough, I'm not saying, but that that would be something I would want to sing because it's so beautiful. Anyways, it, it's interesting. There are some opera tunes if you like opera scenes that i love so much that i even i'm not my i would not be involved in them for instance la boheme i've done colline in la boheme and the, there are two rules i can do in la boheme i'll do colline or do shonat but neither of which are involved in the third act it's just a marcello rodolfo and the two ladies mimi and Musetta. So I love that part where Marcello starts off with Mimi. They do their duet. And then it's Marcello and Rodolfo. Then it's uh, Rodolfo and Mimi. Then the quartet with Musetta and uh, Marcello. Uh, when they sing the adio part, I, 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 I don't, there's nothing. Yeah. Just, it, so you'll always find me, instead of being in my dressing room, I'm backstage from the sides just listening and watching them because it's such gorgeous that's what i did when i was in dc in 2014 and to me, so that Puccini's middle acts are his best in yes. most cases so in tosca and in butterfly it's all great but bohem act three is actually the middle act because we do one and two together and then four comes at the end yes so three is just to me a glorious achievement. La Fanchula del West, the second act, is really the great act. Yeah. And uh, Turandot, I think you could argue that act two is the great act. 
I, I want to explore that more about why Puccini did that that way. That he seemed to. It is because I mean the second act. Think about it in the second act of Turandot. It starts with the the three musketeers, the three masks who come in. I mean they cross all upon, all upon, all upon, but. And then there's the part where they change. It's just you're like, wait a minute. These are not the kind of roles you think are that important, but the music he assigns yeah. to them. Yeah. It's just um, yeah. So I Puccini, I I mean I love Puccini just for listening. Although I heard you roles. in Dallas as Let's Go. <laughs> oh I've, yeah. I've heard you in as many things as I would like to, of course, because we're in different places often. But I've heard you as Amanazro, I've heard in English, I've heard you as Let's Go. I've heard you as Balthazar and Amal and the Night Visitors at on yes. Opera. I've heard you in Moby Dick. Um, but We missed out on Simon Bocanegra. I would have done Paolo Albiani, but COVID did us in. We I know, in Washington. Like in Washington, yes. That was on my schedule. I seem to remember it was November or something because Bocanegra and Don Carlo are my two favorite Verdi operas, and I go wherever a Bocanegra is being done. And it's not done that often, which I no. think still think is one of his darkest, if not the darkest, Simone it is Bocanegra. the darkest, yeah. yeah. And I love I love everything about Simone Bocanegra. So it's People interesting because about he, the story. Bocanegra yeah. also doesn't go that high. Yes, he has those Fs. It's one of those roles where, I've, of course, I would first start with Paolo. But later on, as I was thinking of Rigoletto, Bocanegra is one of those roles I'd love to do. Well, you and I will talk then, because I worked on the Abato Streller production with uh, Capuccilli and Franey and Carreras and Ramondi wow. and Gaudov then. And uh, it's just when you learn from those masters, it's whatever little I can pass on to you, I'll be glad to do. That, that um, duet with Capuccilli and then Gaudov in the beginning. I know. Ah, Yeah. Then you had a Verdi, you had Otello with Vickers, Rizanek, and Tito Gobi, with whom I studied. Um, and you told me that part of what you liked about this particular performance is that Vickers sang the music the way Verdi wrote it. What did you mean yeah. by that? Well, Mario Del Monaco is one of my favorite Otellos too, right? And of course, uh, Placido. But they, they, do the declamations there. So most of them, they don't sing the full part. It's Dio, Pipotelfi, Scaliar. But there are notes that they wrote. And there's nothing in the music, if I still remember, that says, oh, there's an opure where you speak it. But I, it's some tradition that I don't know where you would know better than I, where the tradition started. I feel that, because in the words, he says, you could have taken anything from me. All my victories in war, all the accolades, you could have taken that, but you had to take the most important part, my love, my wife, because he thinks she's uh, cheated. And a man who does that is not screaming. And my name, my good name, he also says. And my good name, yes. Yeah. A man who does that is, and the way Red wrote it, is not screaming, but the, he's so wounded. Mm -hmm. That's why the music is so quiet. And I also feel that some other productions and some conductors rush it. No. He's telling you how he feels. It's really not nice. It's the, one of those vulnerable moments. And then who better than, than Vikas to just do? The, you, when he's crazy, he gets crazy. But when he's wounded, you feel it. But he sings the notes. And then we've got the great conductor, Dulio Serafin. Yeah. So the, that whole, that whole, it just brings meaning, which is why I think I understand why Maestro Muti sometimes, you know, would just lock heads with people because he feels that sometimes when you do all these so-called traditional things, we chip in what the composer wanted, especially Verdi, as you had alluded earlier on. He was one of those incredibly smart uh, composers, not just to compose music, but he understood drama because he grew up in the theater. And so we chip in it when sometimes we, yeah, I know some parts you want to sing the high notes because it's tradition. Fine, do it if you have it. But I, I think it's even more powerful when you do what he wrote and do it more convincingly. Uh, that's, that's the AVA in me speaking. <laughs> and your final pick I was very interested in um, because we have a similarity there. 
you picked Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata as played by Claudio Rao, the Chilean pianist. And the reason the commonality was, apart from loving that work, is that when I worked at the Met, and as I mentioned earlier, I would often be full of energy as a very young man and would have to then come down from that. On my CD player, my bedroom, you could program it to keep playing. I had a row playing Chopin Nocturnes. And that's how I slept, was Claudio Rao playing Chopin Nocturne. So I could see the Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven with that. Why, why did you pick that particular work and performance? Because it's the interesting part is that I have, I've seen other pianists play that. And it's interesting that Claudio Arau, even though he could just play fast if he wanted to, or if he needed to, as he demonstrated in that piece, but he always preferred, even when he played Debussy, to play it slowly. And if you are unacquainted with him, you, you would think that he's not able, that no, he was a virtuoso when he needed to, but he just appreciated what was written even more. And so then I listened to this and I felt that especially younger pianists, they want to show you how fast they can play and how great they are. But sometimes I feel that they may miss what the, the piece is about. Then you have someone like Claudio Arau who says, let me show you what Beethoven actually meant. So that by the time we get to the first part in the third movement, you can feel that. But apart from that, it's just the way he plays it. It just makes me feel I'm like, okay, uh, the, nothing else exists in my life right now. I, I'm just in the present moment and all is well. Th that's what that piece does for me. Musa, I think that people who did not know you want to know everything about you now after our conversation. I think those of us who knew you somewhat feel that we know you a lot more. We admire you even more. I meant what I said about your ability as a writer and as a speaker to express ideas and concepts in ways that I don't encounter with that many musicians. I love musicians and they do great things and they express musically, but this particular conversation was gratifying to me because you put everything so well. So oh, all I can you. say is thank you. How do you say thank you in Xosa? Xosa. Xosa? Oh, so in Xosa, you would say they are, they, they are different ways. The first I would think of is Diabulela. The Abulela. The Abulela, which is, I, I, I thank you. There's another one, which that, that one now is even tied to religion, where you say, Engosi, which means, I thank God. I, 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 I dedicate this gratitude mm -hmm. to God because of you. I, I think so highly of you, Engosi. Engosi. So either Engosi, which is E N K O S I, Engosi, or the Abulela. Yeah, Boulain. Well, I yeah. say both to you. And All right, I thank you. Habe Dank, as we say in German. <laughs> and keep up the good work, and I look forward to when I can hear you perform again live. Okay? Yeah, thank you so much. All thank right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well. Thank you, you too. <laughs>